we're going to look at advances in techniques in hydrogen peroxide sterilization monitoring and specifically look at the detection of vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization process failures in clinical settings using chemical indicators. This is my um, background. I, I won't uh, read it in any great detail, but uh, I've been in the field of sterilization technology for over 40 years. I worked in some UK hospitals for a time, and then I moved to a, a, the 3M company and specialized in sterilization technology, both in product development and scientific affairs and education. And then when I left 3M, I uh, created my own consulting company, which is the Brian Kirk Sterilization Consultancy Group Limited. This is my faculty disclosure. You can see that I'm the director of my company and we specialize in education, training, standards development, and consulting on specific projects related to cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. I'm a consultant to the 3M company as well. So these are our learning objectives. We're gonna look at recognizing the various processes that may be used for sterilizing single use and reusable medical devices. We're going to identify the approaches for sterilization process specification, validation and routine monitoring. And then at the uh, latter end of the uh, presentation, I'll talk uh, about the outcome from some clinical case studies in which chemical indicators were used for detecting failures in vaporized hydrogen peroxide sterilization processes. This is our content page, which more or less mirrors the, the learning objectives, uh, but are, are presented in a little bit more detail. So let's, uh, let's start on the main body of the presentation. So first of all, let's have a look at the different sterilization processes which were available for sterilizing both single use and uh, multiple use medical devices. And there are many microbicidal agents which are available to kill microorganisms. And some of these have been made use of in sterilization processes. And this diagram tries to summarize and segment those different processes into different uh, categories of sterilization process. So on the left-hand side, we have physical processes and these can be divided into hot and cold processes. The hot processes would include moist heat, uh, which is steam sterilization and dry heat. And of course, moist heat sterilization is very familiar with a hospital practitioner and probably 95% of processes are uh, carried out using moist heat uh, sterilization. We then have the cold processes which would include UV light, and then uh, the ionizing radiations, such as gamma and E-beam, and these are used extensively in the manufacturing industry, less so in hospital manufacturing. And then we have the chemical microbicidal agents, and this would include the alkylating agents, which include ethylene oxide, low temperature steam with formaldehyde and glucuraldehyde, and then the more modern agents, uh, oxidizing agents, which would include the hydrogen peroxide vapor sterilization processes with and without plasma and incorporation of other uh, microbicidal agents. And then we have more esoteric agents such as chlorine dioxide, peracetic acid vapor and ozone gas. If we look at the utilization of low temperature sterilization in healthcare, this would include ethylene oxide, which is a very reliable technology with wide application, but its use is country specific. It's widely used in the medical device industry uh, on a large scale to sterilize pallet loads of single use, usually plastic made medical devices. There is also low temperature steam with formaldehyde, 
but this again is very country specific. Uh, it's used widely in Europe, but uh, it's not really recognized in the USA as a sterilization process. And then of course we have hydrogen peroxide vapor sterilization. And this has been available for many years, but it's still regarded as the new kid on the block. It is a growing technology, but it has uh, very specific application areas. And I remember attending a conference and Professor Tony Young stated that as the field of endoscopy develops, there will be a greater need for sterile endoscopes. And of course, this is where these low temperature processes come into their own because many of these flexible endoscopes cannot be sterilized in high temperature processes. So let's have a look at some basics. Uh, the first is that uh, sterility assurance is ensured following three processes. The first is specifying, and this involves writing a detailed specification explaining what equipment is going to be used, the process steps, and how it should be monitored. We have validation, and this is documenting and carrying out a procedure that provides data showing what we want is what we get. And for, for all intents and purposes, that is a sterile, safe, efficacious product. And there are three steps in the validation process, which involves installation, operational, and then performance qualification. Now I know that in some areas of the world, that's also called product testing, but nevertheless, it aims to achieve the same objective, and that is establishing that the processing cycles used in a sterile processing department, an SPD, can sterilize the loading configurations that the SPD want to use. And then, of course, we must uh, take measures to routinely monitor the sterilization process. Generally speaking, sterilization processes are quite complex and they could be regarded as unique events. So having validated our process, we must then make sure that uh, every cycle that we operate still falls within the required specifications. And if we get all this right, we will end up with a, a sterile product. So let's have a look in a bit more detail in the vaporized hydrogen peroxide process. It's the most recent process for sterilization of packaged heat sensitive medical devices. There are no specific standards for hydrogen peroxide processes, so all of them are different. Um, I know there are local guidance documents in some countries, but standards in terms of the international standards or European standards organizations, these don't exist at the minute, but they are in preparation. Now, some of these processes will use a plasma phase, others use hydrogen peroxide mixed with another microbicidal gas, such as ozone. Two of the most popular hydrogen peroxide sterilizers are made by the ASP company. It's called the Sterad machine and Steris do the V-Pro. And these probably have the biggest footprint uh, in the marketplace, although are, there are now lots and lots of different manufacturers entering the market with different sterilizer types. Process temperatures range from maybe 30 to 50 degrees C, and exposure times range from 30 to 100 minutes, depending on the complexity of the load. So if you have a very complex load with lots of cavities and lumens, you will need a longer time to process the device effectively in a hydrogen peroxide process. These hydrogen peroxide processes do have some limitations such as uh, restrictions on the length and width of a, a lumened instrument, which can be sterilized. And uh, some packaging will inactivate the hydrogen peroxide vapor. So it's very important that cellulosic materials should be excluded from a hydrogen peroxide process. So more specialized packaging, such as the Tyvek type packaging would be recommended. The use of plasma is possible, and some sterilizers use a plasma phase at the end, 
of the hydrogen peroxide exposure stage in order to inactivate the hydrogen peroxide and make the emissions non-toxic. Other sterilizers use a plasma phase at the beginning of the process uh, in order to provide some element of preheating of the load prior to the introduction of the vapor. So how does vaporized hydrogen peroxide process work? It's essentially down to surface effects. So let's have a look at a very simplistic uh, view of this process. So the hydrogen peroxide vapor is usually produced from a concentrated solution of hydrogen peroxide in water. And it's often supplied as a single dose cartridge or in small volume containers, which plug into the machine. You don't have to open them and expose yourself to the concentrated uh, solution, which is extremely corrosive. Once in the sterilizer, the liquid hydrogen peroxide will be transferred into a vaporizer where it is turned into a vapor. And this is usually by a, a heating process. And once it's in the chamber, you will have a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and water molecules uh, as an intimate mix present within the chamber. Now this mixed vapor will then penetrate into the medical device and it will condense onto the surfaces which need to be sterilized. And assuming that the surfaces are at a lower temperature than the vapor, uh, typically 50 degrees C, that condensation effect will be quite rapid, creating a small micro layer of liquid hydrogen peroxide and water on the surface. So the critical process variables of a vaporized hydrogen peroxide process, and these are the variables that contribute to microbial kill, would be the time and temperature of exposure, the hydrogen peroxide concentration, and often moisture is considered a critical process variable as well. Now, time and temperature can be readily monitored uh, instrumentally. And in some sterilizers, the concentration of hydrogen peroxide is measured using UV spectroscopy within the chamber space. However, the question always remains just how important is the presence of moisture and what impact does its concentration have on the uh, overall sterilizing efficacy of the process? And this is still a, a quite a hotly debated subject area. So, certainly. Uh, time, temperature and hydrogen peroxide concentration are our key process variables, but many people would also argue moisture is also a critical part to consider. So what do we need to monitor to ensure the efficacy of the process and how? So again, I reiterate that we need to monitor the process variables, and these are the variables which contribute to microbial kill. And there are three basic methods which can be used. The first is physical measurement. And these physical methods employ instruments which measure the physical variable. So that would be temperature and time uh, or hydrogen peroxide concentration. And this can be measured in some sterilizers by spectroscopic instruments or it is also possible to measure the increase in hydrogen peroxide concentration by virtue of the pressure rise that occurs when you inject the vapor into the chamber. Now, clearly, any physical indicator will only measure one of those process variables. So it is important that uh, if you're monitoring the physical conditions in the sterilizer, you need to have a, a range of different monitoring tools in order to make sure the process is effective. There are biological indicators, and these are preparations of living microorganisms. And these are usually a bacterial spore, which has a defined calibrated resistance to the process, but which are ultimately inactivated by the process. Now, biological indicators will react to all of the critical process variables. We then have chemical indicators, which usually give 
some kind of uh, color change and they will uh, respond in a defined way to the process that they are monitoring. So what can go wrong? Well, most hydrogen peroxide uh, sterilizers will have several operating cycles built into them. And these are designed to process medical devices of different complexity. So you might have a short cycle for surface sterilization, or you might have a much longer cycle uh, for a complex instrument like an endoscope. Now it's very important that the instructions accompanying the medical device and the sterilizer are followed. It's also important that the sterilizer chamber is not overloaded and that the instrument sets are positioned at the correct location in the chamber. The sterile barrier system should be considered carefully and it must not contain cellulose because as I mentioned earlier, cellulosic paper-based packaging materials will absorb and inactivate hydrogen peroxide, preventing it uh, effectively killing the microorganisms on the load. Rigid containers can also be used, but again, they must be validated for use in the hydrogen peroxide process. Now, many sterile processing departments will use accessory items within the container to allow ease of handling or positioning of the instruments within the trays. But again, it's important these should be validated for use in the hydrogen peroxide process because some materials like paper can absorb hydrogen peroxide and therefore reduce its effective concentration uh, available for killing microorganisms on the load. So how can we assure the sterilization process is effective? Well, ideally the action shown in this table would be used to detect possible process failures and provide evidence of an effective process. Thus, the first step would be load monitoring, and this is carried out usually using biological indicators, preferably enclosed within a process challenge device, and they would be used along with examination of the process data, which is produced by the sterilizer itself. Pack monitoring would involve placing a chemical indicator in every pack, and this provides evidence that sterilant has actually penetrated through the packaging material and to the point of placement. And these indicators are particularly useful for the operating room teams uh, because it then provides evidence that that particular pack is suitable for use. And this is actually one of the requirements of the WHO surgical safety checklist. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Every pack should have a process indicator placed on its external surface so that people can clearly see that a pack has either been processed or not processed. You still read in the scientific literature and press of incidents where surgeons have used non-sterilized instruments in their surgery. And this is essentially down to the fact that a clear evidence of processing has not been provided by virtue of some kind of uh, process indicator attached to the outside of the pack. And as with any quality-based system, we should keep good records of the processes that have been used and the loads which have been processed during the, the normal operations of an SPD. So let's have a look at chemical indicators. Well, if you look at uh, ISO 11140, Part one, you will find that there are six categories of indicator specified. The first are process indicators. These are type ones and they're for use on the outside of packs to indicate that the pack has been processed. The second type two are specific test indicators such as the Baradic test. And these would be used on a routine basis to check that the uh, sterilizer is working correctly. The third type are single variable indicators. The, these indicators have been around for a long time, but they offer limited utility because as stated in their title, they only monitor one of the uh, process variables. 
And then we have three further categories, four, five, and six. And these are categorized according to the performance specification. So multiple variable indicators respond to two or more variables in the process. Integrating indicators respond in a way that mimics the response of a biological indicator. And then emulating indicators are designed to monitor and give a, a pass or fail response to a very specific combination of exposure conditions. So let's now have a look at the results of a clinical study which was carried out some time ago. And uh, as we're all aware, there are many chemical indicators on the market for monitoring hydrogen peroxide processes. So um, it was decided to carry out a study to see if a number of these indicators performed in the same way when used in clinical settings. Now, this material was published in the Central Sterilization Journal. It's published in Germany, uh, multilingual, and it appeared in 2020. And you can see the citation there. It should be available. I know you can get a, a reprint of this from the uh, 3M company if you wanted to read the detail of it. So what was the purpose of the study? Well, eight commercially produced chemical indicators of type 1 or type 4 were used in clinical settings to see if they could detect hydrogen peroxide sterilizer processes which were operated according to the manufacturer's recommendations or operated outside of those recommendations. In other words, uh, they were used, if you wish, off-label. In phase one of the study, carried out in the first SPD, tests were carried out to see if the CIs could detect the use of a correct and incorrect loading configuration. Um, and in order to do this, three model loads of increasing weight were used, one which was well within the limits uh, specified by the manufacturer, one which was just a little bit over the upper limit, and one which exceeded the upper limit by a good margin. In phase two of the study, at a second SPD, tests were carried out to see if the CIs could detect the use of an incorrect processing cycle. So a standard load was employed, which was processed according to its instructions, and then in a process which was too short. So these are the products which were tested. You can see uh, the manufacturers uh, from various parts of the world and the products themselves. Now this slide shows you the model loads tested, but I think it's much easier if I show you these pictures, which are a little bit more descriptive. So these pictures are showing the model loads, which were described in the previous slide, and the positioning of the groups of CIs, uh, which were labeled left, middle, and right for load XI, DV1, and DV2. And then center, and edge for load STE and STS. And I hope those descriptions are pretty obvious. You can see that the indicators were positioned in the left, middle or right hand side of the individual um, load items. And then with the STE and STS, they were either placed in the center of the uh, model load or they were arranged around the outside of the load, actually supported within the porcupine mat, which you can see in the corners of that sterilization container. So in department one, we use three standard loads, the XI, DV1 and DV2, and they were all exposed to an express cycle. The XI was a Da Vinci XI endoscope set within its mounting tray. It was double wrapped in non-woven sterilization wrap and secured by hydrogen peroxide tape. The load weight was um, 7.7 .7 pounds, and this was within the weight limit specified for that cycle. DV1 was a Da Vinci SI probe mounted on pillars in an Esculap aluminium quad filters container. D2 
this load weight was around 11.7 pounds, which is just a little bit too heavy for that process. And DV2 was pretty much the same as DV1, but two of those probes were introduced into the container. And this was quite a heavy set, weighing 13 and a half pounds. In department two, we used just one standard load configuration, which was labeled STE and STS, depending on whether we processed it in the express or standard cycle. And um, it's a Striker 1588 pendulum camera with an integrated coupler. It was placed in a, a half uh, size rigid DIN uh, double filter container. The load weight was 11 pounds, which is a little bit too heavy for the express cycle, but it's within the limits for the standard cycle um, as recommended by the striker instructions for use. So all of the tests were carried out in a Sterad NX100 hydrogen peroxide sterilizer, uh, as I mentioned, at two different sterile processing sites within US hospitals. And as you can see, the loads were introduced into the lower part of the chamber as shown in the pictures. The sterilization cycle again was a, a standard cycle and this is showing you an example of what that either express or standard cycle looks like. So the methods of analysis of the color change uh, on the CIs was by two methods. The first was by visual examination uh, according to the manufacturer's instructions. So each chemical indicator was examined in good light conditions by a single observer, that was me, and the colour change results were interpreted uh, according to the manufacturer's instructions. The second measurement that was taken was using a reflectance colorimeter, this x right instrument you can see in the centre picture. Now this device provides a, a measure of the colour uh, using three coordinates, which are called the L star, A star, B star coordinates. And these uh, represent a colour within um, a colour sphere. So uh, if you look at the left hand picture, you can see that that picture tries to represent a three dimensional space. So L star values represent the lightness or darkness of the colour. A star values represent either red or green, plus or minus, and then B star values represent blue or yellow. And so you can imagine by specifying those three colours, you can identify a, a colour in any of, of those colour spaces um, specified. This graph just gives you an idea of what the colour change looks like in terms of A star and B star values. So, for example, the 3M trimetric goes from blue to pinky purple, and you can see how uh, its A star, B star values would change as the colour underwent its own change. And then this is uh, an example of celerity, which goes from a dark mauve colour to a yellow colour. So let's have a look at the results. So the first question is, can chemical indicators detect incorrect loading configurations or processing cycles? Well, these pictures show you examples of the actual indicators which were taken from each of the test loads, uh, which are identified at the bottom of the graph, XI, DV1, DV2, and ST and STS. And the actual bar charts are showing you the values of the measured E star values. And so uh, we're by measuring E, which is a, a combination of L star plus A star plus B star, we can then start to do some statistical analysis to see if these colours actually statistically differ in intensity. So for product A, this showed observable differences in colour between each of the test conditions. And there were measurable statistical differences as well as the observable differences. However, as you can see in the picture, the 
reference color was a deep orange and all of the colors were lighter and therefore interpreted as class results. For product B, this showed similar differences, but again, because the reference color in the IFU was a dark orange red, all were interpreted as passes. For product C, this showed observable differences between cycles XI and STS, which are the recommended cycles, and, and that showed passes. And there were significant differences in the values of E, which were also observed. Product D shows differences in colour change between XI showing a pass and DV1 and DV2 showing a fail. And CIs in ST and STS were both passes. And there were differences in statistical differences in the measured values of E. We now look at the type 4 CIs in different loads and cycles. Uh, product E and G showed observable differences in colour between the recommended and not recommended operating cycles, and there were measurable statistical differences. Product F showed barely observable differences in colour between test conditions XI and STS, and DV1, DV2 and STE, which were not recommended. And again, there were some statistical differences in the uh, measured colours. For product H, there were very slight differences in colour between XI and STS and the other three, but they were pretty much equivalent to the reference colour. So it, all of these were interpreted as, as passes. And there were some statistical differences uh, observed. So the next part of the study was to establish if CIs could detect variation in processing conditions at different locations within instrument sets. So we're now looking at individual uh, instrument sets, but CIs positioned at different locations within those sets. So if you look at the bottom of these graphs, you can see that we, we're looking at samples from load XI and chemical indicators placed at the left, middle and right position within that uh, instrument set. And then we're looking at STE and uh, indicators located either in the centre or at the edge of the instrument set. So product A showed observable differences in the CI colour between positions left, middle and right. And there were marked differences in colour between the edge and centre in the load STE. And again, there were statistically significant differences between the measured values of E. Product B pretty much showed the same colour in all tests, and only one set of samples had a statistical difference in the measured value of E. Product C showed a lighter colour at position left when compared to middle or right in load XI, but values of E were not statistically different. For product D, this showed the same colour change in left, middle and right position within load XI, with no differences in E. However, the values of E for the edge and centre location in STE were statistically different. So for the type 4s, a similar kind of pattern emerged. You can see for product E, this showed a much lighter colour in the left position in load XI uh, compared to the middle and right. And again, statistical differences were observed. And you see the same differences in colour between edge and centre in load STE. Product F showed pretty much the same colour right across the board. Product G showed a similar colour change in load condition XI, but you can see that it differentiated between the edge and centre in uh, load configuration STE. And again, there were statistical differences in the measured values of E. Product H showed more or less the same colour change 
right across the board. So this slide shows the color change of sea eyes, which showed variations in color from within the left, middle and right hand side of load XI. And these differences in color are possibly due to differences in either the temperature or hydrogen peroxide concentration as a result of different masses at the different locations of the CI. So if you look at the right hand side of this load, you can see that there's more mass present than at the left hand side. And this mass may have caused the temperature fall to drop or the hydrogen peroxide concentration to be lower due to condensation on the cold surfaces. If we look at load STE, you can see that a number of the CIs show differences in color change from the edge to the center. And I could only conclude that that was due to possibly the porcupine mat, which you could, that yellow mat you can see in the background, was absorbing uh, some of the hydrogen peroxide vapor, uh, causing a reduction in concentration. And of course, that would in turn cause the chemical indicator to show a fail condition. So let's have a look at some conclusions. Sterilizers monitor chamber conditions, but provide no information about the conditions within packs. Sterilizer and medical device manufacturers recommend processing conditions. However, combining the medical device, sterile barrier system and accessories can alter the conditions inside packs. And the conclusion from this is that it's essential that performance testing or performance qualification is an essential activity when introducing a new medical device or sterile barrier system or accessory item into the sterile processing department workflow. Carrying out replicate tests on the new load configuration using the intended sterilization cycle with multiple CIs located throughout the load will identify the best position to place the CIs. Now, many national and international guidance documents recommend locating a CI in every pack. The WHO surgical safety checklist requires that OR teams check the sterility of every pack. And so examination of the internal and external chemical indicators is one piece of evidence they can use to uh, confirm that that sterility has been achieved. So this table shows a summary of the test outcomes, and there are essentially four questions which are asked. The CI shows appropriate pass and fail results in recommended and not recommended cycles. And you can see that some of the products satisfied that requirement and others didn't. And then the CIs show differences in processing conditions at different locations within individual packs. And again, you can see some of the indicators were able to pick up those differences and others were not as indicated by the picks or crosses. Now, in terms of the precision of measurement accuracy, again, you can calculate a percentage value for the precision of measurement. And you can see the indicators which provided the best precision in terms of measurement output. So on that note, I'll thank you for listening to the presentation and I'll open up the floor to a Q&A session. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name's Brian Kirk. Um, I hope you enjoyed my uh, earlier presentation. Um, as a result of that, we have a number of questions which uh, our audience have sent in. So over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, we can have a discussion uh, around uh, the topics that those questions have raised. So the first question uh, is uh, to do with uh, the use of paper materials in hydrogen peroxide processes. And um, the, the uh, issue is, uh, or the issue that's been raised is to do with the possibility of paper uh, catching fire during a hydrogen peroxide process. Uh, the second part to that is whether or not 
the inclusion of paper in a hydrogen peroxide process uh, uh, actually lowers the efficacy of the sterilization process. Well, <laughs> to my knowledge, I haven't heard of uh, any fires uh, arising as a result of placing paper in a uh, hydrogen peroxide sterilization process. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of uh, any reports of, of that happening, but most certainly if you include paper or other cellulosic based materials in a hydrogen peroxide process, then the interaction with the cellulose and the uh, vapor, the hydrogen peroxide vapor, will cause the vapor concentration to actually fall. Um, and we must remember that we're not using very high concentrations of hydrogen peroxide in these processes uh, in the vapor form. So uh, as a result, um, it is very important to exclude certainly paper packaging uh, and other any other uh, sources of uh, cellulose or paper in the sterilization process. Otherwise, the efficacy of the process can be quite badly affected uh, as the uh, paper-based packaging uh, soaks up the hydrogen peroxide, inactivates it, and therefore reduces the effective concentration in the chamber uh, and on the surfaces that we wish to sterilize. Uh, there are lots of alternative uh, non-paper-based um, packaging materials which you can use. There are even uh, rigid containers uh, which can be used, but again, you need to make sure that the filters, if you're using a filter type rigid container, that the filters um, are not paper-based. Some, some of them might be. Um, otherwise, as the hydrogen peroxide enters the rigid container through the filtration uh, port, uh, then obviously it's going to impinge on uh, paper-based fil filters and, and probably be de deactivated. So overall, uh, the bottom line is keep paper away from these processes. There are plenty of alternatives. Um, and uh, as, as I uh, hinted at in the presentation, if you do happen to have some paper in, in the um, process, then uh, the chemical indicators will quite probably pick that up as, as a and show a fail because the concentration um, either in the chamber or in the packaging or in the container will have been reduced. So uh, the second question that we've received is, um, would it not be imperative to push stroke force endoscope manufacturers to provide scopes that can be sterilized in uh, processes other than ETO gas. Now, this is a very interesting question. It raises a number of points. The first is, well, uh, what, what about the discussion around whether or not endoscopes need to be sterilized? And there are a number of um, uh, areas that can be explored in that discussion. The, the first one is the clinical need. Do we actually need to have an endoscope that is sterile? And of course, uh, many clinicians will say, well, some of these endoscopes we're inserting into, uh, for want of a better word, dirty or contaminated body cavities, and therefore why would we bother sterilizing them? Um, but of course, many of the endoscopes are also inserted into if you want uh, sterile body areas. Um, and therefore it is imperative that those devices are sterile. Uh, the other side of this discussion, which not many people actually consider is the logistics side. So most endoscopes, when they've been high level disinfected, will have a, a very limited shelf life before they would uh, either be used or have to be reprocessed unused. And of course, the use of a sterilization process means that the endoscope is sterile, and therefore there is no concerns about uh, microbial growth or development of further contamination in those endoscopes because they would be in a sterile barrier system. They would be subjected to a validated sterilization process. 
and therefore like any other medical device they would have a either an indefinite or a very long shelf life so for scopes that are not used particularly frequently and i know there are some uh, many scopes are obviously used several times a day but for the scopes that are using frequently the use of a sterilization process to um, uh, deliver a, a sterile scope has logistics advantages in that they can then be stored until they need to be reused. Um, with regard to the processes that um, endoscope manufacturers recommend, now this, these are governed by the local regulatory authorities where uh, activities are taking place. And um, ISO 17664 is a standard uh, describing the uh, reprocessing instructions that every a manufacturer who produces reusable medical devices must provide and of course if you look in the latest edition of that standard you will find that manufacturers are required to provide an awful lot more information about the types of process that can be used. Now many uh, endoscope manufacturers will have validated their um, endoscopes for sterilization in ethylene oxide and that's fine. I know that some of the other manufacturers will also have provided instructions for sterilization in um, vaporized hydrogen peroxide processes. So it's a case of that there is choice out there and many of the manufacturers are looking at uh, uh, these uh, hydrogen peroxide processes as a means of uh, sterilizing uh, endoscopes. Um, so they might offer in their instructions a couple of processes. One will be EO and the other might be hydrogen peroxide. So I think the industry is um, beginning to respond to uh, uh, the need to provide more than just one sterilization process. Um, the, there's a, another question which isn't actually on the um, on the chat room, but um, during the presentation, you, you will probably remember that uh, some questions are raised about whether or not the water concentration in a hydrogen peroxide um, process is uh, a, a vital, uh, vitally important uh, characteristic of the process. It, it's a process variable. Now, in the past, when I, I've done a presentation of this kind and had polling questions in within the embedded within the presentation. Um, we have asked that question and, and in most cases, the majority of audience members do agree that uh, water concentration is a vital component. And of course, if you think back to how I described the process, hydrogen peroxide vapor is created from a solution of hydrogen peroxide in water. And when that goes through the vaporizers, um, both the water and hydrogen peroxide components of the mix will be vaporized and introduced in many cases into the chamber. There may be some additional steps on the way which change the ratio of water to hydrogen peroxide. But inevitably, I think you will have some water present in the chamber. And uh, therefore, um, do we actually need to measure that? Uh, do we need to measure the ratio of hydrogen peroxide to water molecules? Um, what are the consequences of having different ratios when the uh, vaporous mixture uh, condenses on a colder surface? Because obviously water will have a different dew point to hydrogen peroxide and therefore there is possibility that uh, a different mix will arise depending on the surface temperature. And I think uh, there are research studies being undertaken to try and examine what uh, the effect of different mixtures of water and hydrogen peroxide have on the measured D value of uh, biological indicator microorganisms. So that is um, an area that um, is worth keeping an eye on to see if in future we will also need to uh, estimate or measure the amount of uh, hydrogen peroxide in the, uh, in the uh, chamber along with the um, water vapour. 
There's another question here. Um, our UV light is always failing on our 100 sterad. Well, uh, that's very unfortunate. Um, I think that's something you need to take up with the manufacturer, but it, it is, of course, the UV light is the uh, part of the device which measures the concentration of hydrogen peroxide in the chamber. And if that UV light is not functioning, then you don't have a measure of the concentration and therefore you're you're missing part of your process record and therefore you uh, cannot really um, uh, accept the the data uh, without that information so um i have heard from other um, contacts that the uv lights can be um, sometimes fail and obviously the service organization ought to be able to respond and re replace those lights uh, as quickly as possible so that you can get your machine uh, up and running again. Um, there, there's one final question. Um, and again, this has been the subject of various polling questions that I've introduced into the uh, presentation uh, in, in other venues. Um, and that is, can the sterile processing department actually validate the sterilizers? Well, of course, if you look at the definition of validation, and I mentioned that in the presentation, um, which is, of course, installation, operational and performance qualification, then when your machine is first installed, the manufacturer will probably do uh, IQ and uh, OQ. But then, of course, the only way that you can do PQ is by having um, uh, an understanding of the relationship between the loads you're going to process and the equipment that you're going to use. So I, I believe it is possible for a sterile processing unit to do some elements of validation by using biological and chemical indicators. Now, clearly, um, the introduction of physical monitoring equipment is difficult because it would probably invalidate your warranties and it would be very difficult for an SPD to be able to introduce temperature or other measuring systems into the chamber. But certainly you can use commercially available biological and chemical indicators and you can carry out um, uh, both chamber and load penetration studies using those devices to make sure that you are getting sterilizing conditions um, in the load items that you wish to process. And of course, you need to bear in mind that there is interactions between the, um, the medical device, the sterile barrier systems, and the, any accessory items that you include in with your load items. So um, it's important to do uh, performance qualification studies um, on uh, actual loads that you're trying to process in the uh, in the sterilizer. Okay, so that was the questions that we received. Um, I hope you found that an interesting discussion, and um, please do uh, stay tuned for the panel discussion, which will begin in in a short time. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>